Okay. So, thank you people for joining us on uh, this uh, showcase session with such a long title that it doesn't fit on a single line. A real life study of large scale personalization with Drupal for one of the biggest extranet in Europe. So, first of all, let's, let me introduce you who we are exactly. So, um, Actancy is a French company. Uh, we actually have two offices, one in Strasbourg, the other in Paris. We are 65 web experts, and we mainly work on projects from 50 to 2,000 men per day. With 100% Drupal and Symfony development, mainly Drupal, but uh, we don't uh, use any other technologies. My name is Nicholas. I'm technical project manager and lead developer at Actancy. I work with Drupal since 2006 now, uh, mainly on our large-scale uh, project. So, what were the business requirements of this project? So, the client was Alcatel Lucent, and he had an existing platform in another technology of a B2B extranet for about 80K users and about 50K contents to manage. Contents were uh, either news, documents, uh, events, whatever. And all those entities, users, and contents were distributed across different services um, that were managed with other technology too. So this uh, B2B extranet had quite, uh, quite huge volumetry, quite huge uh, volumetry of visits and uh, of connection peaks for a B2B extranet. Uh, so we had quite uh, important issue with performances, as you will see later. Um, what were our main objectives? First of all, migrate everything to the Drupal platform and host everything on the Acquia network. Those were the two principal um, objectives of this project. Now there were secondary objectives that were the migration of a business rule system and a quite complex permission system, as you will see, and connecting Drupal to all those different distributed services across um, the Alcatel Lucent network and actually improve the performances because the old technology platform uh, was quite uh, quite not performant at all with a page load of more than 10 seconds on some pages. Our main challenges on this project were the security with a quite complex uh, permission system, as you will see, and uh, the business rule that help us to um, generate every user profile, as you will see. The migration in phases uh, was quite a big deal to deal with. You will see this uh, later. And the performances was uh, one of the greatest challenges. Um, so if you take the Drupal permission system, basically it's a one-way credit definition. Every, every permission is stored on the user side. Basically, you, uh, Drupal, every user has a, um, um, implicitly a a, a role in Drupal. It can be anonymous user at least <coughs> or authenticated one, anything. But all permissions are always stored on the user side. So when the code is defined, then the contents are or not creatable, readable, updatable, deletable. Okay. On our specific project, the CRUD system was a bit complex. We had profiling data on user side and on content side. And we had to define a specific process in the middle that will calculate the final CRUD permissions. If you know Drupal well, you'll know that this is really hard to do. You'll, you'll see later how we managed to do this with only, well, main, mainly only uh, Drupal tools and some custom module too. The volumetry was quite a problem too. As I said, about 80K users, more than 50K documents. If uh, you take a one-to-one -one ratio, 
you end up to something like 4 billion permissions. This is really huge. Uh, I think by the time we made a little park of this, and uh, I, I guess the, I think the, I don't get the right number in, in mind, but I think the node access table uh, just exploded to something like two gigabytes of data, and it really decreased the performance a lot. Um, another uh, big deal on this project was the fact that every single piece of <coughs> content on a single page had its own permission meaning a single user uh, don't see the same thing as another one because every, every block of content has its own permission, uh, read permission or update permissions that it's uh, on its own. So basically, uh, two people don't see the same thing. Well, if some of you uh, already gone to the um, performance or well, the caching session this morning, Drupal 8 uh, does uh, this very well. But with Drupal 7, it's kind of tricky to uh, achieve this really efficiently. The business rule um, system that the client wanted us to um, create was uh, kind of tricky. So basically, every user had specific data on its profile, markets, services, things like that. And uh, the client wanted the possibility to add and create a system of rules that will be calculated each after another to determine a specific profiling data for the user, meaning all those rules will generate which permission the user has to see or not a document. So basically, uh, the, mig the migration in phases also um, gave us quite uh, little problems. As you can see, we had the legacy platform connected to different services, one for the content, the other for the users, another to generate companies for the users. Everything was connected to each other and we had to connect Drupal basically to all of these services without losing any information on any stages, on any step of the migration. So you'll see that was kind of tricky too. Now, what, uh, well, what were the impacts of this, uh, of this migration in phases? First of all, knowing that some contents still exist on the legacy platform as references, for example, in a block of content on the side or anything, you had to be sure that your new system implemented the permission system before anything else, because you don't want any user to see a content that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't need to see. You also have to keep uh, every link to the, um, to the unmigrated contents to be sure that any reference that may be done uh, linked to something that does exist. You don't have to lose any content on one on the, or the other platform. We also add to handle an ACSO <coughs> to be sure that any session exists both on the whole platform and the new one. We had to keep contents and user profiles synchronized between the two platforms through all those distributed services. And as some of you may know, when you do, you do a migration, generally you bring every problems from the old system, you bring them to the new platform, and you had the new platform problems on it. So one of the big deal was also to <coughs> limit this problem and to learn from past error, propose new solutions that may fit the client's need more. So, well, uh, on the performance side, we had many asynchronous calculation for all the permission system. So you'll see that this handled the queue API very heavily, and um, it brings us some it brings us some quite big performance issue. We had uh, some locks on some tables because of. Um, you know, MySQL don't like when you try to query multiple time the same table at the same time. So sometimes it's, it can bring you uh, big locks. Um, the one page equals multiple web parts uh, with different permission system was also quite a big deal for the performance, as you may know. With, as I said, um, node access table with two gigabytes of data uh, just uh, decreased the performance a lot. So. Even if we can optimize this, it, it remains some uh, a great problem. Um, 
we, have, we had huge volumetry of data. The caching was to be chosen wisely because as we had those different blocks with different permissions, we had to cache everything per user and per content. And well, that's all. Oh, well, we, we have also had the classical media performance issue that any project had. So what did Drupal gave us for this? First of all, the permission system. As you remember, 80K users and 50K contents means 4 billion permissions. 4 billion permissions is about several gigabytes of data in a single table, decreases permission. So what can we do exactly to um, make this work better for Drupal? Does 50K contents really mean 50K profiling patterns? Does if one of your documents, for example, only has read permission for a specific market, is this permission unique in all your database or are there different documents that share this permission? Is it possible to gather every contents on the website that are profiled into groups of permission? Well, we tried this and we found that uh, there was something like 3,500 patterns that exist and basically if you try to record those permissions it's significantly less permission to store and there Drupal can well it's still a big deal but Drupal can handle it far better and the performances are better so is there a way for Drupal to do this basically that's what organic group does if you if you people know the, the, group, the organic group module this module just allow you to group documents by permissions and it allows you to link user, con user account to those groups. So basically, if a user is able to see some contents because he is a member of those content groups, well, basically, if another user don't have the same groups, he will see other, other contents. And so we tried to work with organic groups because with organic groups, you can lighten your, you can really, um, how to say, you, your not access table is really preserved. You will have <coughs> far less entries in your table and your permission will still be uh, efficient. So we used organic groups and we developed three custom modules to work with this. The first one is the content group engine. This module helped gathering every content by permission patterns. For example, any time a document uh, was saved and a metadata hash was created. And there should be only one organic group per metadata hash. So any time a new profiling pattern appear, it means a new organic group has to be created so that all documents that fit this particular permission patterns can be grouped to this. Um, sometimes when you have um, simultaneous addition, you may have uh, multiple organic groups that handle the same permissions. Well, it may happen, it's rare, but it may happen, and basically it's not a problem because your logic still works. Anytime you have a group and documents linked to them, anytime you have members to those groups, even if those groups rep represent the same permission patterns, everything is fine. So you just have to um, have some proce cleaning processes that will sometimes um, merge every organic groups that represent the same permission patterns. So basically, this content group module, what, it, what does it do? When any document is created or updated, if the permission uh, patterns already exist, it only link your document to these organic groups and everything is done. If it doesn't, then it creates a new organic group with this new specific permission pattern and it tries to profile it against every user on, on the website. Now, let's see for the user and this famous uh, business rule engine. Okay, so the user have several data on their profile and um, Basically, the um, client wanted to be able to write those rules quite easily, so we 
used a simplified PHP version. It's quite, well, it's quite specific with some tokens. So basically, this line here is uh, one of these rules. If you read it on the, on the first part here, you've you try to reach the market of a user. This little prefix here means that you try to reach the user. You check if uh, the market equals one. Then here you try to get uh, the user company market and you made some tests here. And if you validate this rule, then some specific categories are um, assigned to your user to build its profiling, uh, its profiling data. Um, whenever one of the user is updated, it may happen that the profiling is not up to date. So we generate for each user a hash every time it is, well, created, but mainly updated. And if the stored hash on the user is not the same that the one that is calculated on the fly, then we know the user profiling has changed and we need to recalculate um, the user profile. So if the hash has changed, we basically recalculate every rules to see if the profiling is good or not. No, finally, that, uh, now that we have our content groups and our user profile, we need to match them together to have our final CRUD permissions. And this is what the last module does. Uh, the mapping engine is just there to grab everything and mix them together. So the mapping engine is <coughs> a custom module that is also highly configurable. As you'll see here, you have a bunch of settings that allow you to define some validation steps. Um, here, for example, the first line uh, tells that you have to compare on the, on the content side uh, field category with a user category uh, field on the user. And this specific operator tells you that the user has to uh, own whole of the content categories to be validated. Um, you have also an operator for one-off, which is a more, um, more open to um, make some different validation step. And you also have a specific um, f Boolean field that allows you to get exception on your contents. For example, if you want a document uh, to be available and to bypass, for example, uh, the mapping engine, on a specific market, for example. Then you just have to check a little checkbox on the document which corresponds to this specific field and the mapping engine will check the value on the fly and if your uh, checkbox is, uh, well, is checked, then it just bypassed the mapping engine process. And we also added some exception mainly for the webmasters because they are the main uh, people who generally need to have exception on the content uh, permission, particularly for the view or um, update, delete um, operation. So for them, it's quite simpler because they just uh, bypass the whole process without having to configure anything but the right <coughs> roles uh, that you want, to, you want to, to process that way. So um, the mapping engine is an asynchronous two-ways process because it has very, very huge amount of calculation to do. We had to generate all the calculation through the QAPI. So there are uh, two ways. The first way is when a user has to be uh, calculated for all content groups. So you have a new user or a user update that changes its profiling data you have to be sure that this user is a member of some content groups that are the one of the is permission pattern. So this is the first way. The other way is when you create a new content group. So you created a new content and this content has new permission patterns and you, knew, you need to add any users that have the right permission to see it. So basically, this process is available on a standard queue process for mainly the user updates or the content group creation. But we had to handle this same process for, with some um, kind of emergency queues for specific case. So we have the specific case of a single user that you want to see right now on the fly. You had it his profile. You want to see the result right now. So we have a specific uh, reprofiling for this. We also have um, a specific reprofiling option for 
our users being active from a, a specific date. So for example, if you have some corrupted data in your database and you want to be sure that all active user, uh, I don't know, on the last week, for example, has the, have the right permissions to see the right documents, then you, you have the right queue to, to calculate this. And finally, we also had a queue for new user because you always want new user to be available sooner than any well, a user update that may uh, be processed on an asynchronous uh, way. So basically, here is a global schema of um, our process. So you have on, on one side the, the contents that may be created or updated. The content group engine will then generate the content groups that match this specific content permission patterns. If the permission pattern already exists as an organic group, we just link it and there's no more operation to do because this content, this organic group is already linked to user with memberships. And if the content group doesn't exist, then you just send it to the mapping engine, which create a queue for it, and we'll try to map it to all the users. On the other side, when you have a user that is created or updated, you check the hash. If the profiling pattern has changed, you send it to the business rule engine that will calculate every rules, every business rules, and that will generate the user profile. And then finally, will be sent to the mapping engine, will, which will uh, link the user to the different content groups. Okay, so that's the global uh, schema. Now, what about the migration in phases? So the deal was to migrate the whole website, not on a single sprint, <coughs> but really features by features. So we had to handle connection to the different services, as I said earlier, for every types of entities. So we had to be sure that the FIFO uh, was guaranteed, to be sure that the first, well, the last update of the content is the right is, is the one that is displayed to the user. You don't want, for example, uh, an old uh, update of a single value of a single item to be uh, pushed on the production environment. You always want the latest version on product. Uh, you also had to take care of uh, any message loss. If one of the services down, you don't want the, the message that is sent to be lost. Um, and you have to take care of uh, any entity reference. If some entities are referenced to um, a single node, you want them to create stubs. You don't want them to be linked to nothing. So you have to create stubs and then complete the entity later when uh, the right values uh, come to your service. And of course, you ha we had to ensure that the security of the Alcatel Lucent uh, infrastructure was um, preserved. So to do this, we created a specific Drupal um, distribution that is called Drupal Q messaging system. Um, this system is inspired by JMS or RabbitMQ for those who know those systems. Um, basically, this uh, instance consists of a broker and central uh, it centralizes every messages in a single Drupal instance. Uh, the, the FIFO is guaranteed by several resequ resequencing uh, processes, and we also have uh, different retry and failure processes to avoid any uh, item lost. Um, the global system is based on um, a topic and subscriber uh, system uh, for both of you who know uh, those two different, um, well, JMS or RabbitMQ uses the same kind of workflow, so maybe it's um, familiar for you. And finally, we used uh, IP restriction and um, access token and SSL to guarantee um, every security because you don't want anyone to see what is exchanged between your services and you don't want, you certainly don't want anyone to modify those information while they are transiting. Um, so this is uh, the global uh, schema of the DQMS system, the Drupal Q messaging system. So you have different services that are linked to a broker, in our case, a specific uh, Drupal distribution system with different topics and services subscribers that will uh, await 
different messages. The broker just push the messages in the right topic and uh, in the right topic queue. And if one of the services is not reachable for any reason, then it just retry until the service is available or if uh, you have defined a, well, I don't know, a limit, a specific limit of time uh, at which it, it just stop and store the message for later retry. On this migration uh, in phases uh, step, we also add the problem of the session synchronization. Um, in fact, the main problem uh, was that the um, specific profiling of this uh, platform had to be preserved on both sides. On our side, we used the all uh, process with the mapping engine, but on the legacy platform, we had to keep the profiling up to date for every user. So we used both the DQMS system to send the profiling updates to the legacy platform, and we also used session cookies information for smaller updates on the, um, on the user uh, um, on the user profile. And then the legacy platform just grab the cookie and update on the fly the user account. Now, we arrive to the little permission, performance uh, problem we encountered. So, the first problem we had with, uh, with um, MySQL was the deadlocks because our mapping engine really often uh, tried to reach sort of certain field of the database. And Drupal, well, MySQL in particular, doesn't like it. So we, there was not particular, well, we could optimize our, our code a bit more to handle this, but we had to have a really great performance on this mapping engine process because the volumetry of permission was really heavy. So we only had to tweak the MySQL configuration a bit, and this allowed us to reduce the lock uh, on most tables. Um, if you guys need more details about what were tweaked exactly, uh, maybe I can, we, can, we can talk about this later. I won't go too much in depth about the solution we had for the per performance issues. We also had uh, quite uh, big issues with the page load. As you can guess, the performance of the, um, the permission system uh, where, well, with our content group optimization, we preserved main of the performance, but there was still some leaks that needed uh, some code optimization. And um, this specific um, page organization with multiple web parts also was quite a big deal. So for those of you who uh, was to the caching session this morning, Drupal 8 now truly uh, is do an amazing job with this and it's really easy to do it. By the time we didn't have the render cache module, so we used panel and panel slash cache to specifically cache um, blocks of content on the pages for a particular user. So the granularity was really easy to, um, to set and every single block of content was then separately cached for a particular user, and that saved us very uh, important uh, leaks of performance. Uh, on the other side, uh, the heavy uh, permission calculation on single page also bring, it, bring us uh, some wide screen of death for webmasters due to the admin menu uh, module, which added some more uh, access check on every pages. So uh, for uh, this particular problem, we only um, replaced the module for some custom admin blocks that, well, were far more lighter. We also had, well, with the Q API, we had the probably the main real pro permission problem. So the mapping engine had a really huge uh, quantity of uh, data to process. And to be sure that the calculation um, will be done as fast as possible, we, try, we, we choose to multi-thread the process. So we had to uh, think of it from scratch as a multi-threaded process. It's definitely not the same way of, um, of working because when you have multiple process, multiple thread, you have probably collisions between some of them. 
so we had to develop some semaphores, some locks to be sure that when a thread grabs an information in your database, another thread won't try to write the same information at the same time. So when the mapping engine uh, is called, whenever one thread tries to work on it, it grabs a log and telling the other thread, okay, wait for me uh, when I'm finished, when I'm done, I give you the lock at your time. So uh, basically this decreased the performance a bit, but on a general, on a global scale, the um, multi-threading uh, really helped us increasing the calculation speed. The number of items was also quite a big deal to handle. At the beginning of our, um, of our process, we uh, stored the, um, some full entities in each item of the queue, and this was really a problem that uh, made our queue uh, table to grow as something like, I think the, the most important size we had was something like 50 gigabytes for the queue table, which was quite, uh, quite huge. So we had to uh, refactor a bit and um, only handle IDs that, were, that will be then um, later um, loaded by the process itself and that will then um, reduce the size of the queue. Well, today, um, on a per day basis, the mapping engine still handle something like, I think, uh, 15 million items, uh, well, constantly. So it's quite a heavy process. <coughs> and finally, I, uh, the main, the, another uh, problem we encountered was uh, the cache, the synchronization for memcache. I don't know if some of you already worked with the Acquia cloud um, already, but um, here on this particular project, we add a load balancer with several servers behind, and each server had its own memcache bin. This was a problem because it introduced desynchronization uh, between the different bins, and sometimes a user um, may be <coughs> served with another version of the same page. And so we only had to dedicate a server to the caching, and that solved the global problem. Okay, so. I'm done for this presentation now. I didn't went too far in depth for the technical aspect, so if you guys have questions, thank you for your attention. I'm here for you.